Um, now we travel to the south, to Australia, um, I suppose exactly to Tasmania, which is even south of Australia. And uh, thank you for staying with us, although it's really um, in the evening for you. You are uh, latest uh, time of the day now, of course, that's also for China, but um, for Cameron, it's even later for you. Cameron, you are working for Hydro Tasmania, and Hydro Tasmania is a state utility uh, of the state of Tasmania, which is a state that practically is already very close to 100% renewable energy, starting with uh, uh, hydropower and uh, then adding, and I can proudly say our current president, Peter Ray, who unfortunately can now not be with us. He, as a chairman of Hydro Tasmania, started also introducing wind power. So you started with hydropower, you are now also looking into the Australian market and you will tell us how hydropower can help to reach a high share, eventually 100% renewable energy share, which you practically have already. Cameron, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Just bringing up my slides now. Um, yeah, so I think the thing what, with that I'd like to start with is really sharing some of the need. So we've seen some really great presentations today on some of the technologies and the how, um, but I'm trying to keep this very much at the need level. Um, I do only have a few slides, so I hope to be able to get us back on time a little bit more. Um, and I would be really keen to share any questions that people may have. Uh, more than happy to answer them either today or afterwards. So please get in touch if there are any questions that you may have. Uh, following on from Stefan's point, uh, Tasmania, as you say, is, uh, has been operating a system which is nearly 100% weather-driven renewables for over 100 years now. And so we really, really understand the challenges of uh, reliability, of making sure that you have the energy when you need it. And that's something which we're very, very passionate about and uh, some of the challenges that I'm keen to talk about today. Uh, first of all, in terms of Australia, uh, so our national electricity market, which is largely what we're talking about, uh, spans six states and territories. It has approximately 40,000 kilometres of transmission infrastructure, and that's about 3,500 kilometres north to south. Uh, we do have some good wind diversity, but as you can see, actually reasonably little east to west solar diversity. Um, and the other key point is that it actually has no link to neighbouring power systems. So when we start looking at the way that Australia's market is operating, uh, we're really having to work within our borders and all of the benefits that we've seen from some of the other presenters about sharing resources and sharing uh, surplus and scarcity with, with your neighbours is not something that Australia has been able to manage at, at this stage. The other thing that's really important to understand about Australia is that we're a power system in transformation. So Australia's present national electricity market is heavily reliant on coal. And most places around the world have seen a lot of their coal stations maybe retiring, uh, a transition through gas, as we're working towards a more renewable future. Uh, a, lot of Tasma, a lot of Australia's coal stations were actually built reasonably late. And what that has meant is that Australia's uh, national electricity market operator, so AEMO, the Australian energy market operator, um, is actually projecting a change where we may be shifting from coal-fired generator straight to uh, renewables backed by storage. And this is a really interesting challenge and a lot of people are spending a lot of time watching what Australia is up to because we are actually, by being slow, in a funny kind of way we've found ourselves at the front in terms of trying to understand how these new high penetrations of renewables and high penetrations of storage technologies are going to affect our grid. Uh, this projection goes forward to around about 2040, and you can see by capacity, the large amount of, uh, you can see by capacity, the large amount of wind and solar uh, that we expect, uh, and then backed up by a substantial amount of solar technology, and the dispatchable generation, the conventional generation, uh, is actually 
getting to be a small fraction of the expected demand. Another thing that I think is really important to share, and this uh, frames a lot of the way that we're thinking about the challenge, is that Tasmania has amazing wind resources. So our present uh, wind resources, which are wind farms, which are uh, approaching 20 years old, are about 40% capacity factor. So we've already heard people talking about uh, how that's changed over time. And yet, if you look up Tasmania on a map, uh, you'll see that the Roaring Forties wind pattern, uh, which essentially blows all the way from South America, uh, lands on Tasmania's western shore. And that means very, very high quality wind. But the other thing is that it actually blows at different times to the rest of Australia. And that means that there are opportunities to be able to share that geographic diversity uh, across Australia. And while we don't have any neighbours in terms of our total power system, we can certainly share these resources across the national electricity market. Australia is also really blessed that we do have some very, very good wind resources in other states as well. Uh, we also have excellent solar resources. And so we are very much trying to figure out the best mix. But one thing that's really important to understand is no matter how much geographic diversity is achieved in the NEM, there are still extended periods of low wind energy output. Uh, even with you know, many gigawatts of wind installed in Australia, we will have periods where there are very, very few uh, megawatt hours being produced by wind uh, and for days on end. And that's a challenge that we need to address. So when we think about reliability, and as I said, a lot of my presentation is about the needs. Today's power system, we see the need for largely shallow storage. So this is brief variations in load or supply. We've got contingency events uh, causing brief spikes in the supply demand imbalance. And we've also got a bit of load uncertainty or supply constraints, which may need, drive a need for some storage. And this is really driving uh, a lot of desire for storages, which are up to a few hours long. But when you start thinking about real wind-driven, uh, weather-driven power systems, you start seeing a structural need for something a bit longer. So if you're trying to balance the solar cycle, chances are it's going to be sunny maybe 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And so you're going to need something to get you through the night. And then if you have large cloud plant bands in a system with substantial solar reliance, like Australia is likely to build towards, you're going to need to have storages which are able to get you through about two days. When we had the major bushfires in Australia, the amount of solar penetration that we already have in our system, we were seeing substantial challenges because the, the smoke was actually really suppressing our rooftop PV. And that was starting to become a very major part of our total supply mix. And the other thing is successive days of minimal wind generation. And as I said, every year we have about three days in a row where the wind really isn't contributing to the system. So in a system where we might be planning for 50% of our energy to be supplied by wind, and that is the kind of scale of numbers that we're talking about, not being able to actually use that supply for three days, that's an interesting challenge. And we need to understand what we can do about that and how we can manage it. In Australia, we've started talking about deep storage. They're storage is with the ability to continuously supply or store for more than 12 hours. And that will play a major role in balancing a weather-driven power system. The other thing that people often talk about is the least cost development. And a lot of the work that we're doing is trying to optimize and understand how we may be able to build a system on economic basis that's really revolving around uh, the renewable energy. And a lot of modeling, a lot of least cost modeling, finds that building wind and solar past the point that it spills produces the least cost outcome. And that's great, and economically it works. However, commercially, this could be really challenging. So these graphics here come from uh, Australian Energy Market Operators Integrated System Plan. And it's possible to see that solar 
a large amount of the solar energy spills. And that means that it becomes very, very difficult to build those solar plants because as soon as you have the first megawatt that is consistently spilling, that's going to start forcing prices down to near zero dollars because the short run marginal cost of these uh, plant is very, very low. And you're also going to find that starts impacting wind, although wind, of course, uh, doesn't blow as consistently, but also doesn't uh, have the same issue of uh, a large amount of synchronous, uh, sorry, not synchronous in the power system sense, uh, coincident supply. And so you can actually get away with it a bit more. Interestingly enough, one thing that storage does provide, and particularly deep storage, is it provides a customer for that previously surplus supply. And that can underpin the commercial outcome that the least cost modeling is finding. So the very fact that there is storage can actually help achieve those least cost outcomes that are being targeted by the economic models. So this is my last of the, the slides. It's really how much storage will be needed. So we've done a lot of modeling on this. We've been using linear optimization programs. We've been uh, using a range of different things. And at a system level, deep storage, so storages that are more than 12 hours of duration, operate more efficiently. And that means they'll operate closer to the modeling predictions because linear programs tend, well, they have a perfect knowledge of the future. But this means that the more deep storage in the system of the future, the less overall storage will be needed because it's actually performing as expected. Hydropower systems tend to be able to provide that really long duration storage and they tend to be able to operate in a way which is fairly optimal for the market and can provide those valuable balancing services. And the key is these aren't going to be balancing services for a few minutes or even a couple of hours but we're going to need balancing services that are able to provide for days. Uh, and so as we start understanding the need and the value of these things, we're going to be in a situation where we're really going to be able to provide both the market for the energy, the market for the balancing services, and then also be able to provide the market where the excess energy can still be consumed in a way which underpins the commercials. And that is the end of my presentation for today. And I look forward to any questions I might have. Thank you so much for this uh, excellent presentation, which is uh, kind of connecting uh, your long-term practical experience with the business case. I think that is something that really the world needs to learn a lot. And uh, of course, obviously they can learn a lot from what you're already doing. Uh, because that is indeed, that will be one of the key uh, uh, challenges in the future, how to optimize not only technically, but also economically our systems. So we, we only use that much storage or power lines and in reinforce the grid, no more than necessary, and have the right balance between these. I'm, I hear these arguments from various sides. Some people say you don't need storage, others say you don't need big grids. And I think uh, probably no one is absolutely true, but Balancing that, that's what you work on. Thank you again for that.